before we get started on the main event, I'd like to hand you over to Marcus Stewart, a Tungurung man and one of today's panel members for the acknowledgement of country. Thank you. Is this mic? Yeah, mic's working. I've got an echo. Um, no, thank you. And um, before I acknowledge country, um, this is an important space of where, you know, all three nations gathered, um, the Tanarung, the um, Jajarung or Jara people, and the, uh, the Woiwurrung. Um, and as I understand, it falls within the Jajawurrung boundaries, but it is a significant place to the Tanarung. 500 metres is our boundary, but boundaries are a linear line, and we like to think of um, boundaries being more fluid than that, and places that brought us together as nations. Not too far up the road, about five or six uh, kilometres hanging rock was a, um, a sacred site to the Tanarung. It was an initiation site that's been used for thousands of years of where our men through, went through initiation and law, and so it holds a significant place. And it's also a, a gathering place of where the three nations uh, come together, as I understand the stories of the Jajarung and, and Wurrung. So uh, in acknowledging country of, of all three nations, because I think it's respectful to acknowledge and not to welcome, um, uh, I want to acknowledge um, Wurrung and Wurundjeri, uh, Wurrung, Wurundjeri and, and Jajarung. And in my language, that's Wawagi, Lewiknugugangaguk, Wawagi Yomagul, Gurubuk Nungodjan. So I acknowledge their country, their people, their elders, and their ancestors. And I'll now hand to Rachel to read out the Uluru Statement from the Heart. And from what I understand, Rachel, you attended the, uh, the rock for the, um, the final dialogue. I did. And it feels appropriate to stand when reading this. So. Um Yes, just take a moment to uh, remember why we're here. We gathered at the 2017 National Constitutional Convention, coming from all points of the southern sky, make this statement from the heart. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did, according, according to the reckoning of our culture from the creation, according to the common law from time immemorial, and according to science more than 60,000 years ago. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion, the ancestral tie between the land or Mother Nature and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom remain attached thereto and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil, or better, of sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished and coexists with the sovereignty of the crown. How could it be otherwise? That people possessed a land for 60 millennia and this sacred link disappears from world history in merely the last 200 years? With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Proportionately, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our children are alienated from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them and our youth language in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. We seek constitutional reform to empower our people and take a rightful place in this our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Makarada is the culmination of our agenda. It means the coming together after a struggle. 
and it captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations people and truth telling about our history. In 1967 we were counted and in 2017 we seek to be heard. We leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country and we invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Marcus, Rachel and Marcia. I'm not going to go into long-winded introductions for each of the three people here because quite literally they do not require introduction. And if you want to know more about them, it's very easy to find out more. And I also pay my respects to all First Nations people who are here and on whose land we meet. And on a personal note, express, and I'm sure you'll all be incredibly astonished and surprised to learn this, express my impatience for both treaty and the voice and if you want to get to treaty, you need to have the voice because that's the voices with whom you will entreat the representatives of the people you want to enter into treaty with. Can I congratulate each and every one of you before we get into the, the meat of this meeting that 300 people come out on a freezing cold afternoon on a Saturday when you could be doing pretty, pretty much anything else, including sitting by a fire, is, I think, all the evidence we need that there is a profound appetite across Australia for this momentous shift in our, our soul as a nation. Not that you would detect that from much of the mainstream media coverage, a topic that we may or may not touch on. I have no idea what these three distinguished leaders of First Nations opinion are going to say. We haven't rehearsed and there are no limits. There are questions that you've submitted. The organisers have given to them to me. I've gone through them and picked out the common themes and they've provided me with the overview. And we'll see how much we can get done between now and 3.50. So let's go to the very core of this. And Marcia, you have been involved in this not quite since time immemorial, but it seems like that. Take us through where it begins for you and how we get to where we are today. Thanks, John, uh, and many thanks to everyone for coming today. Many thanks to uh, uh, Marcus and the traditional owners. I have heard a bit about Marcus's background story, his life story. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to be on the border of Tungarung country, and thank you, Marcus. I acknowledge the traditional owners and the elders and the ancestors. So when I was in my 30s, uh, I was living in Alice Springs and uh, Elliot Johnston, the National Commissioner of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, the late Elliot Johnston, QC, you see, uh, asked me to run the, the underlying issues unit in the Northern Territory. He w instructed me to find out from people in the communities and the towns why people were dying in custody what was leading to their deaths because clearly from the hearings and the evidence uh, and of course most of the evidence was police evidence hospital evidence and so on uh, we were never going to get at the truth so your uh, professional background was i'm an anthropologist and geographer and i had been working with the central land council for seven years uh, lodging land claims, or doing the research on land claims across Central Australia. So I said yes, I'd do it. Um, and I, 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 there are a few people in the room who might remember those days in the late 80s uh, and the debate about the Royal Commission. Um, so I put together a team and we visited, I think, 36 communities, interviewed hundreds of people, and we wrote a report called Too Much Sorry Business, which is an appendix to the five volume Royal Commission National Report. 
Uh, it was uh, largely redacted uh, by submission from the Police Association of the Northern Territory, no surprises there. And uh, uh, it's not much of it has ever seen the light of day, nobody bothers to read the appendices, but we have got the message out in all sorts of other ways, and there's no denying that back then in the late 80s, there was a profound change happening in the Aboriginal world, and the Aboriginal leaders, the ritual leaders, the elders, were very concerned about the young people, very concerned about the rapid changes that had impacted them. So, there were 336 recommendations of the Royal Commission. Very few of them have been implemented, and even if they were, they were only implemented for a short period of time. And again, we're calling for the implementation of critical recommendations. Um, we're up nearly at 550 deaths in custody, Aboriginal deaths in custody since then. Um, so uh, one of the outcomes of the Royal Commission was the establishment of the Aboriginal Reconciliation Council under a statute, uh, which was limited to 10 years. So there were three councils. I was, uh, Patrick Dodson chaired all of them. Um, I was in the, a member of the middle council, uh, but I, I remained involved and at the end of it, uh, the, the council submitted a report to the Prime Minister and the people of Australia uh, at Corroboree 2000. John Howard rejected every recommendation in that Corroboree 2000 report from the Reconciliation Council, including a pathway to constitutional reform and an apology to the stolen generations. So that was uh, 30 years ago now, but all of those issues continued to arise. So th throughout that time, as Rachel will be able to tell you, because she's made a wonderful documentary about it, and it is online, it's easily available, about all of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander representative bodies that were set up and then abolished. So I'm jumping over all of that history of giving us something, taking it away and playing political football with our lives. And uh, I'll take you to uh, 2009, when, or 10, when Julia Gillard appointed a, a group of us to an expert panel on the constitutional recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And of course, she'd arrived at this point with Kevin Rudd uh, following petitions from Yolngu people, from Yunapingu leading the Yolngu people in Arnhem Land, two petitions to Rudd and Gillard. So our expert panel met over a two year period, we consulted widely. We produced a report uh, with uh, recommendations for how the constitution could be changed to eliminate racism from the constitution, the racism at section 5126 and at section 25 and replace it with a new section 116A, which in brief uh, proposed that the parliament as section 51 does uh, uh, allow for, uh, to make laws for, and instead of the racism, we said the advancement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, the Conservatives totally rejected it, but so too did the opposition leader at that time. The, the Prime Minister was Tony Abbott. The opposition leader was Bill Shorten. They called about 40 of us together at Kirribilli to tell us that it was not going anywhere, forget about it. Uh, and the constitutional lawyers who'd advised them, such as Greg Craven, uh, insisted that the constitution could not ever contain anything that looked like a human right and had to be totally clear about parliamentary sovereignty. Nothing in our recommendation, of course, affected parliamentary sovereignty and uh, uh, you know, I cannot see how the peace and good order and of, of the co people of the Commonwealth is a part of the Constitution, but the same for Aboriginal people is not acceptable. Now, you'll see that Greg Craven's backed down 
from all of his pedantry <laughs> and is suddenly saying that it, the yes vote is the decent thing to do. He said in his most recent writings about it that he'll hold his nose and vote yes because he thinks it should be slightly different. But let's not get caught up in the politics so of it. So we, we get to today. We get to two processes, the referendum council process and the voice co-design process. I was in the voice co-design process and the referendum council ran the dialogues, the 12 dialogues leading to the National Indigenous Constitutional Convention at Uluru, which I'll leave to Rachel to explain. But I worked uh, with 51 people, uh, co-chaired the senior advisory group with Tom Calmer. Um, Who was then the Human Rights Commissioner? He'd been Indigenous the Aboriginal Rights and Torres Strait Islander uh, Commissioner in the Human Rights Commission, Commission and the Race Discrimination Commissioner. Yep. Um, he's the Anti-Tobacco Commissioner. Uh, he has many roles. He's presently the Senior Australian of the Year, um, even though he's younger than me, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> Most people are younger than you, Mouse, yeah. Uh, that's true. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going there. So, so we worked for two and a half years and again consulted widely with thousands of people across Australia, every institution and body in Australia, and presented two reports, which the minister at that time, Ken Wyatt, uh, presented to cabinet. So the interim report to the, went Mor the Morrison cabinet to the Morrison cabinet, in which Peter Dutton was a senior cabinet minister. member, senior yep. cabinet member. The interim report and the final report. So the first report was about 260 pages and the, uh, the final report was 260 something pages. So more than, well almost, well more than 500 pages of detail right there uh, that he saw, that Dutton saw as a cabinet, senior cabinet member. Uh, that report is available online uh, and I could summarise it but I think I've gone on for too long. There is a summary of everything in those reports at page 16 of the final report in which we recommend up to 35 regional voices and a national voice which would consist of two people from each state and territory, well actually one from the ACT and one from the territory because of their population numbers, two Torres Strait Islanders, uh, I think one Torres Strait Islander representing Torres Strait Islanders who live on the mainland and five national voice seats for people from remote areas because of their extreme disadvantage a permanent advisory group of young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and a permanent advisory group of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who live with disability because one in four of our people live, in, live with a disability. Um, much of it caused by diabetes too. So uh, that's a quick summary. It's a very, it, and the amount of work that's been done to get that amount of traffic through on this issue. I mean, I pay tribute to you for your perseverance through any number of disappointments, but let's, let's park that because we don't want to get stuck on it. And thank you for the potted history because there are people who say, oh, this has come out of nowhere. And the evidence you've just heard is that that is a patently wrong statement of fact. It can't be put more bluntly than that. This is not suddenly descended from the clouds. Rachel, take us to Uluru. How did that come about and how did this document that you so beautifully recited, how did that get created? Um, yes, well, can I acknowledge as well the Tungarong um, people and Jajarong and Wurundjeri. Um, I'm from the Arunda and Kalkadoon people, so people from around Alice Springs and Mount Isa, so I'm very long way from home and very cold. <laughs> but um, I'm really pleased to be at this, what a great community gathering, can I say. It's wonderful to see you all here. And um, I just wanted to say that, um, uh, look, I'm, I support the, uh, the, the yes vote, obviously, but I'm really open to having a conversation about the whole spectrum of views, so um, really happy to be here and talk amongst us, you respectfully on this question. Um, so unlike Marcia, I haven't been a leader in this, um, I've been more of a follower and we all know that followers are very important. Um, 
Uh, and I suppose I'm the daughter of Charles Perkins, who um, has been a leader. And um, when I was thinking about, well, what role can I play in this? I thought, well, I'm not an Indigenous leader. I'm not necessarily a lawyer. I'm not any of those people. But this is an issue. The Constitution belongs to us all. And it's for all Australians to um, make a, you know, have a choice on this. So I've been involved for about the last eight years in a voluntary capacity. Um, I call myself like just one of the normal people <laughs> involved in this because not necessarily an expert. But um, so I come here with that background. Um, uh, one of the things that first informed me, I know I'm not quite asking or answering your question, but I will. Um, I looked at a report that was done in 1995, uh, which my father, which is why I mentioned him, uh, was the chair of a, a report. Again, it was like the process that happened leading up to Uluru, like the process that Marcia described when they were doing the report into what the voice might look like. My father, with others like Linda Burney and many others, went around the country after the Mabo decision and asked Indigenous Australians what their aspirations were for the future of their people and their country, um, that native title wouldn't be able to um, recognise. And one of those things was recognition in the Constitution. And that was in 1995. And I read the letter at the front of that report which said, we give this report in the hope that it is not ignored and left on the shelf like so many of our reports have been before. And unfortunately, that report was ignored, left on the shelf, and here we are, you know, now, um, more than 40 years later, finally on the process of uh, journey towards constitutional recognition. So it's a, it is a momentous uh, moment. But in terms of Uluru, um, so I'd been volunteering. I went to a um, community gathering that was put together by the Central Land Council, which Marcia used to work at. It's the biggest representative body in Central Australia, covers thousands of kilometres, about 25,000 Aboriginal people. Um, so they put that together. Um, and um, I was elected as a representative um, to go to the, to the National Convention at Uluru. But at, in, in near Alice Springs, we had, you know, we talked through all of the issues. We discussed um, what we would like in terms of constitutional recognition. And that was one of those 12 meetings that Marcy describes that happened around the country. Um, so we talked about our issues and then representatives from all those 12 meetings came together at Uluru. There was about 250 of us. And um, all of the discussion that had happened at all those 12 meetings was then distilled down at Uluru and discussed over a three-day period. And at the end of that three-day period, the Uluru Statement um, was prepared and written and uh, unanimously endorsed, apart from, I think, seven people, Indigenous people, who chose uh, not to support it. So it had an overwhelming consensus. Um, so seven walked out out of how many? Uh, about 250. And of those seven, one of them is still maintaining a very high profile resistance yeah, which to is the fine, overwhelming right? support. It's fine. Like not, every, not everybody in this hall has the same view on things, right? Not no. all Indigenous people have the same view on things. S sorry, I'll, I'll fill in the gap. Lydia Thorpe is one of those who walked out. Yeah, no, he's, and has, he's, been, he's has, been, <laughs> has been consistent in her opposition from that point to and now. onwards. Yeah, no, I think... We're pretty aware of that. Um, but what I'd like to emphasise is rather than that, if I may, is the overwhelming consensus that was achieved in that moment because the people who had come from all of those 12 meetings were members of their community. They were often put there because um, they were with Aboriginal organisations or they were members of representative organisations. There were the land councils from all over the country represented. So it was a huge consensus. And we know now that consistently since that time and before that even, uh, we have very reliable data collected by Reconciliation Australia, which is a government organisation, very reputable data, that over a period of at least since 2017 and before, we've had consistently high support from Indigenous people for constitutional recognition and for the voice. So that's very important to understand because the media often will, of course, go to conflict because that sells newspapers. 
Um, but I think it's important for you to understand that it's about 86% of Indigenous people support this, which is an overwhelming consensus and majority. So we're, we're here on this stage and we're just a few people, but you should understand that standing behind us, there are thousands and thousands of Indigenous people who support this. And so, Marcus, thank you. And to... Thank you. And, I mean, it is an important point. A lot of people don't realise that, that that was so overwhelmingly supported, this false equivalence that you've touched on in the media of, as if the, the people who are opposed to it are the same in proportionally as the people who support it within Indigenous Australia. And, in fact, it was 7 out of 250 who opposed it then. And the proportions, do we think they're about the same now? Well, that's why when you're emphasising, you know, as you did then, um, people who, dis who have dissent, you know, I actually say, well, can we just focus on the massive consensus? Yeah. Um, it's very important. But, but I think there's, there's one other thing I'd like to just say, um, if I may. Um, the constitutional recognition, it's important to understand how we see it, I think. And it's twofold. Constitutional recognition at its fundamental core is about recognising the deep connection that Indigenous people have to this country over that millennia. That's what it is at its core. It's a foundational aspect of the identity of the country and its deep past and it's what it makes us unique in the world. And Indigenous people and many, many of our fellow Australians agree that that is so significant that it should be recognised in our highest legal document, that it has a rightful place there, alongside recognition of our European heritage and all the institutions that come with that. So that's what we're recognising in the Constitution. But what Indigenous people have asked for is that that recognition take the form of the voice. So it's not just words that don't have any effect. It's recognition in the form of a voice because Indigenous people have asked that we have a practical way of participating in the democratic process that ensures that when specific laws and policies are made about us, that we can make representations or give advice about those laws. Mm -hmm. So it's symbolic recognition for our connection to this country and the identity of the country, but the form of that recognition is through a voice. And I think that's quite a nuanced concept, and I think that's why people go, what is this about? And it's fair enough, right? Because I didn't really know what it was about until I sat in rooms with people for eight years. But that's the nuance, it's twofold. It's the symbolic recognition, but in the practical way of a voice. To make a difference. So Marcus, the... <laughs> the Victorian state government has embarked on a separate strand of recognition that's got quite its own history and structure. Can you explain, first of all, what that is? because there's some confusion in people's minds, well, hang on, what's going on about all that other stuff, and explain how they dovetail together. I think what, um, fundamentally and principally, what has happened in Victoria is we've gone down a journey of treaty, or a journey to get to treaty making, but that's through voice. I should talk to this, not to John, yes, sorry. To um, and that's through voice. What our community fundamentally said on the back of um, probably the, the longest and most extensive consultation process as far as public policy goes is we wanted two fundamental principles. We wanted to be able to represent ourselves um, and we wanted to be independent of government if we were going to go down a journey of treaty, which is how voice come about. Now, why is that? If we think about a footy analogy, given we are in Victoria, could you imagine last night the Brisbane Lions picking the team for St Kilda to play them? They're not going to pick their best players. I wouldn't. 
don't know about you, but I certainly wouldn't. Wouldn't have um, made any difference. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe as far as percentage goes, but... Um, <laughs> Um, so ultimately that was on the back of the consultations, if we had conversations how we wanted to represent ourselves uh, in the treaty journey. So uh, we had stood up the First People's Assembly of Victoria, uh, which is our elected voice here in Victoria, and I've had the privilege of leading for the last three and a half years until the end of next month, which will be, uh, which will be great. Uh, and we've just finished and we've just gone to the back of our uh, our second election, which we've significantly grown our electoral role and voter turnout, which is an amazing outcome, just shows the buy-in that we've built through our community on the back of what we saw as some of the most horrific bushfires down our east coast, um, and on the back of a small matter like an international pandemic, which um, we know how hard it hit us all here. Um, so we've gone through this uh, mechanically and by uh, design, John, we've gone through voice, treaty and truth. We haven't negotiated a treaty, but treaty has long been the aspiration that we've heard in Victoria. It's been the mechanism of what we've heard from our community here in how we improve the lives of our people. What is hope? What is a future like of bringing us together? And that's uh, essentially why we called on a truth process. How can you have reconciliation without an agreed um, an agreed history of what happened in this country. You can't reconcile if you haven't been able to have the conversation about what actually happened or how that was experienced. And so that's where the Yuruk Justice Commission come, the Yuruk being the word for truth in the uh, Wamba Wamba Nation name, um, and it going down an inquiry mechanism to piece together the experience as experienced by First Nations people in Victoria, not there to be challenged, not there to be fact-checked by, you know, no offence, Art, but all the anthros out there, but um, to collate a truth of what they understood to be or what they had experienced vicariously or transgenerationally through the trauma of uh, colonisation and invasion in the country. And we got to the process of delivering a um, treaty negotiation framework, a treaty authority, a self-determination fund, which is the ecosystem for treaty making, depoliticised, we've got bipartisan support, um, a truth-telling process, as I said, through Yuruk Justice Commission and the First People's Assembly, which is now going into negotiations of what um, treaty may look like. That's Victoria, but that's not, I mean, it's different on a national the national sphere, but what was important... I'll just every other thing. state has, or almost every other state has now commenced a similar process yep. following Victoria's lead, is just the point I wanted to interrupt to make. Yep. Absolutely. And um, why we had bipartisan support was a fundamental belief that Aboriginal people were best placed in the driver's seat to determine their destiny, especially when it comes to issues that disproportionately impact them. To this government in Victoria's credit, they let Aboriginal voices carry the reform. Yep. And that's why it's been successful. And the bipartisanship, and this is now my political commentary, came from the National Party within the coalition opposition. The Liberals couldn't see why it was important, the Nationals did, and the Nationals said, well, we actually do have Indigenous constituents. The Liberals, by and large, don't. This matters to us, and if we're in a coalition, we're telling you we want to support it and make it bipartisan. And it's a great credit, I think, to Peter Walsh, and I, I see Marianne Thomas, your local member, who's the Minister for Health in Andrew's government, is nodding. It's a great credit to the National Party that they were prepared to do that. <laughs> and, it, and it cost some skin for the Liberal Party. There were people in the Liberal Party who bitterly opposed it, but they were told too bad. That's a bit of editorialising from me. Marcia, what is it about, I mean, Canada's way down this path. New Zealand's way down this path. The United States, way down this path. What is it about Australia? I mean, my father, a hundred years ago, going to school in Wellington, New Zealand, was taught Maori culture and language. We're not doing it yet. What is it about Australia that's left us behind? If that's a very big question, John. Uh, and I'd just like to say in my defence that I did an undergraduate degree with a double major in anthropology and I did my PhD 
largely in anthropology, uh, but I actually graduated from Macquarie University in the School of Earth Sciences, but examined by anthropologists and a First Nations uh, political scientist. Uh, and I've been an engaged anthropologist all my life. You won't find me losing a land claim. I think I lost one in Cape York. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, and uh, I've, I've moved into medical anthropology in recent years. So, it's not the discipline of anthropology, it's actually, you know, the people behind the degree that matter. You can have competent anthropologists and highly incompetent anthropologists, e.g. Mm. the team on the Yorta Yorta, Yorta case, uh, who famously lost that. Now, I think part of the answer to your question lies in this issue. How much do Australians know about their own history? Well, I want to say about Rachel that she is in fact a leader, um, <laughs> but she's a very subtle leader. Um, All leaders need good followers, you know? Just... Yeah, well, actually, <laughs> Rachel uh, made a television history series, The First Australians, an eight episode television series on SBS. It's still being shown and there were uh, books and uh, teachers' resources that accompanied it. And from all that has been said to me by people who've watched the series, I was one of the talking heads in it, um, they, it, it's very clear that tens of thousands of Australians did not know anything about this history. Um, and I'm now involved in a national Indigenous curricular project precisely because generations of Australians have learnt a, a very warped view of Australian history. Um, when I was at school, uh, in primary school, you know, 60 something years ago, uh, the, what was taught in school was that the Aborigines had passed. Um, smooth the pillow of a dying race. Do you remember that Smooth the pillow phrase? of the dying race. Um, the savages were eradicated. I grew up in Queensland. And uh, so most Australians, and, you, and you see it, you'll see it in the newspapers even today, that there are some tribal Aborigines left and everybody else is, you know, according to Andrew Bolter, fake, right? Um, the truth of the matter is that, uh, let's start with the big lie. The big lie is in the Constitution. And the Constitution deems all the original people, the Aboriginal peoples and the Torres Strait Islander peoples uh, to be all members of a, an imaginary race, right? So that's how the Constitution was constructed. The, except for Aborigines, was removed from section 5126 with this, in the 67 referendum when Australians thought they were voting for equality for Aboriginal people. But in fact, what happened then, and most people don't know this bit, and this is how you are all being deceived by the no case, what happened then was that there, there were a series of um, higher court appeals on a sacred site case, the High Marsh Island case, and it ended up in the high court um, it's called the Cartinuary case. And the High Court ruled that the Constitution could not be read to require a government to act in the best interests of any race, which then John, you know, John Howard's government turned into uh, a mandate to use the Constitution to cause harm to us, the First Peoples. With the intervention? Well, the intervention was actually a triple banger. They used the external affairs power because it was the Northern Territory, but they suspended the Racial Discrimination Act so that the Racial Discrimination Act did not apply to any of the parts of the 500 pages of legislation. And so that enabled them then 
to uh, implement policies, laws and interventions, such as the basics card, income quarantining, um, and many other measures that did not apply to any other peoples in Australia. They were race-specific. Race, race specific. It was not race-specific. It was specific against the Aboriginal peoples of the Northern Territory. So this is what I want to say to you. That constitution was written in the 19th century at the peak of the Australian colonial period. And remember back then, it was only in Victoria and New South Wales that where there was a majority of, of white people, of colonists, because they had managed to eliminate most of the peoples in, these, in this part of the world by then, or people had died from diseases such as measles, smallpox, the influ various influenzas. But in Queensland, the north of South Australia as it was then throughout South Australia, Western Australia, the Tasmanians had suffered the genocide already, and the Torres Straits, the majority of people were still indigenous. And the constitution was constructed so that the white colonists in Victoria and New South Wales, who would have been paying taxes into the Commonwealth, did not have to distribute, distribute those taxes across the states and territories to everybody. So in order to confine the distribution of taxes to white Australians, they put the race clauses in the constitution. And so everybody who was non-white was deemed a member of a race and Aborigines in particular, small a Aborigines, as in the pre-67 constitution, all peoples called Aborigines were deemed to be members of a race. But here's the thing, there is no such thing as race. We've mapped the human DNA. There is no biological phenomenon that fits the concept of race. Race is a social construct from the imperial and colonial period. It's a fiction. And today, there is no reputable science who can tell you that this race exists or that race exists because that's not what the human genome tells us. <clears throat> so the people who are running the no case keep talking about race. They're the ones talking about race. They're telling you that we, the yes case, are trying to cause a racial division. But you see, what we're actually trying to do is we can't even eliminate the racism from the Constitution because, as I said, Abbott and Bill Shorten rejected our expert panel recommendation. And this is very important to understand. At that meeting, uh, we were all told to go away and think again. So Noel Pearson did, and he wrote uh, an essay called A Rightful Place in which he argued that, all right, if we cannot eliminate, if, if, if the parliamentarians and the constitutional experts, and not all agree with this, but there are some people who think they're more expert than others, <laughs> e.g. Greg Craven, um, he's yes. not a practicing lawyer, <laughs> right? Um, Hi, a lot Greg. Of Hi, Greg. <laughs> so, no, but this is, here's where all the arguments are coming sure, from. Sure. Um, all the others say this is, you know, this is a misreading of it all. But the, what Noel said was this, all right, if we can't eliminate racism from the Constitution, if you all say no, we're not allowed to do that, let's just have a measure that limits the impact of the racism in the Constitution as the overriding law that enables the Parliament to make laws that can cause detriment to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So his idea of the voice was a way to give Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people a representative body 
to say to the parliament, well, look, this law is going to impact badly on Aboriginal people, and not only is that a racist thing to do, it would have a harmful effect on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in X, Y and Z way, right? So it's a, the barest minimum mechanism, it's the most minimal mechanism that anybody can think of to limit the ability of the parliament to pass racist laws, not only racist laws, but laws directed at Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are intended to cause harm, as the intervention was. And there are various other laws that do as well. But I could sit here for hours telling yep. you about those. So what we're proposing is a, a limit on racism. It's not even a, an end to racism, it's merely a limit on racism. Now, not only does the concept of race not exist, it's, there's no evidence for it, what we're up against is not race, but racism. So the hangover from the 19th century, where we were cast as savages, as primitive peoples, with whom no treaties could be negotiated, and that's what terra nullius means. Terra nullius, which was overthrown by the Mabo No. 2 decision of the High Court, said that's not a concept that fits with a modern day democracy um, and uh, it's totally rejected. So the High Court rejected terra nullius, which was the view, the 19th century view, that our peoples were too primitive to negotiate a treaty or sure. any kind of settlement. So the nub of the problem is this. Our entire country has a kind of overhang of racist 19th century ideology and law, including constitutional law, and that's the paradigm. Yep, okay. So let's get, I'm conscious of the time, and there's some um, practical issues that have been raised in the questions that you've all submitted, and again and again the same issues have been coming up, partly from politicians and partly also from media commentators and people who are some of the so-called experts, as Marcia just pointed out. So, Marcus, take us through. One of the main criticisms that we hear from people who oppose the voice from both the Indigenous um, dissenters, I'll call them, but also from a lot of um, so-called, um, well, self-proclaimed and self-described well-meaning uh, commentators, politicians, bureaucrats, all sorts of people, is they say, oh, it's not going to make any practical difference. It's purely symbolic, and why would you bother? Take us through why your view is that that's misconceived. Well, they'd know, wouldn't they? So let's all just go home. Um, ultimately, what does history tell us? History tells us that we've seen consecutive governments and consecutive failure. We've seen, well, we haven't seen an opportunity, and there's been multiple political arguments, right? So I'm probably a bit close to that mic. Um, there was one this week floating around about, you know, um, funding where we know if there's a voice in place, its worst case scenario would be cost neutral. Because when you start aiming for the critical mass, and the critical mass is advice from the people it impacts most, our most vulnerable in our community, you start achieving outcomes and start actually implementing solutions that will change the status quo and the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So it's easy politics, John. It's easy to say, this isn't going to work. I don't like it because it doesn't fit with their political ideology or people just like want something to write up eds about. Um, you know, and there's numerous reasons why people are opposing it, illegitimate reasons as far as you know they're self-motivated, but ultimately, we can talk about the politics, the side of the no, the side of the yes. All that matters right now is regardless if you are made a decision you're voting yes or no, is your ability to talk to each other as Australians. We need the conversation to start of where people can engage and go, okay, I might be sitting here, you might be sitting there, but what does a country or what does a future look like that our kids and grandkids will inherit that can actually make a difference? We're all about supporting the young underdog in a fair go. Why is that not the case for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? Why is it so difficult? We know the statistics, we know the outcome. 
ultimately what's important in this debate is not the politics, but it's our ability as a thriving democracy to have a conversation with our neighbours and our colleagues, whether it's at our kitchen table, in our lunch rooms, down the local pub, football, netball club, wherever it is, we need to start talking to each other about what this opportunity is and what it can achieve. Okay. In the field of aged care, disability care, and lots of other fields of the provision of services by government, there's a phrase that's used all the time, which is nothing about us without us. Rachel, is, is that what this boils down to? Is it as simple as that? Um, yeah, I think, um, as Marcia described, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are one of the few groups that have special laws made about us. And because we are 3.8% of the population, we're a tiny minority, our vote doesn't really count. Um, it doesn't have the weight um, of influence, um, apart from perhaps places like the Northern Territory where we're 30%. So democracy, influencing democracy is difficult for us. And so when laws and policies are made about us, often they're made um, uh, in a number of ways. One, they, they're, they're made uh, very far away from the communities which they affect, so literally thousands of kilometres away um, from the places, and also they're often quite a uniform when our communities have very diverse needs. And so um, what The Voice hopes to do is bring voices from regional Australia, as Marcy has described, grassroots voices, to the table so that they can offer their expertise and lived experience into both the parliamentary process, so when laws are made about us, and also into, importantly, the um, executive of government, into the bureaucracy, um, because that's where most of the business is go of government is done and most of the um, planning is done about program design and program delivery. So we say that, well, look, we live, we live in these places, we have built up expertise over time. What we would like to be able to do is speak to the bureaucrats when they're designing programs and say, hey, we, we think things could be done in a better way. So in Central Australia, where I'm from, here's an example very briefly. Um, recently, they changed the liquor laws and the local Aboriginal Medical Service Congress um, was pleading with them to do it in a different way. Um, and so this has happened in Labor governments, in coalition governments, in all forms of government. It's not specific to one government. Those views weren't um, taken on board. And we saw all of the effects of um, those restrictions being lifted in a very detrimental way. Recently, those uh, restrictions were reimposed and we've seen um, rates of crime and domestic violence drop by 30% in Alice Springs. Now, if those voices had been listened to, it might have been done differently. At the moment, my community would like three issues looked at. One is um, the nutrition in Aboriginal uh, community stores. We pay 52% more than any other Australians for our fresh fruit and vegetables. We need to do something about that. Um, and we also want to impose greater um, tariffs on high sugar um, uh, products in, that are coming into our communities. Soft drinks. Marcy talked about that diabetes too is, is has a huge impact in our communities and um, lowers our life expectancy. We want to we want to have voice on those issues. We also want to have voice on housing and have more autonomy around our housing because one in 20 people are homeless uh, in the Northern Territory. We have very high rates of homelessness because of the low level of housing availability. So these are things that would make a real difference in our lives in an everyday way and our organisations and people know this. They have the data, they have the lived experience, that's why they want to have a voice at the table when programs are designed. Now it's very important to know that what we are asking, it's so modest it's almost embarrassing, right? Because all we're asking for is that advice to be heard. So it's not a veto over Parliament, it's not a third chamber of Parliament, it's just for us to be able to make representations to Parliament. Okay, so take us through the next step is if, if what Lake Tyres wants is different to what Burralula wants, which is different to what Kununurra wants or, or wherever it might be as we go around 
all those different and complex interactions that make up Indigenous Australia, how do you, after, let's, let's assume you get the yes vote and then you have to set this thing up, how do you get that variety of views to well, feed into a, a decision-making body? Well, Indigenous people have been very good at organising themselves and writing endless reports and um, giving advice. The problem is, is that that advice has not been given much weight. Gets ignored. And that's, that's the problem, right? Um, the important thing about constitutional enshrinement, and this is why we're asking for enshrinement, because, of course, we could set up this body any day of the week through legislation, right? It can be done now. Um, but the reason we seek constitutional enshrinement is two things. One is that when that advice is given and if the referendum is successful, our views will have the weight of the Australian people behind them, the moral weight. And that is something politicians actually listen to. They're not going to listen to 3.8% of the population. They may not listen to the women in my community, but they'll listen better if Australians say, you must hear them. So that's why constitutional enshrinement is important. <laughs> this, thank you. The second reason, the second reason is that although uh, they may be able to legislate the form of the voice, and Marcy you described one option, which is, you know, 34 or 37 regions going up to a body of 24, and it might, that might change um, depending on what the government does. Um, the enshrinement means that whatever the form of the voice, it will always be there, right? And that is significant. It gives us a respect. Like, it gives us a respectable place in our democratic process. We have been disrespected and it gives us a voice legitimacy because it's in the Constitution. The reason I mentioned the report my dad had written, because it was so, so much work, so much effort, so much aspiration had gone into that report, and there's so many of those reports, but they have been disregarded. So constitutional enshrinement gives respect to the voice, it gives, it gives, it cements it in the process, and the moral weight of the Australian people ensures that it will be considered. So that's why it's important. Marcus? Yeah, I'll just, um, I completely agree with um, what Rachel said. It's significantly modest. Um, it's, we've seen some debate in the parliament over the last two weeks around, you know, what it might make or might not make representations on. That'll be at its discretion. But what it does is three things. It'll have conversations completely fine in a, in a democracy. It will make representations to the parliament and the parliament or the executive will make a decision on whether it acts on that. But right now the debate from that side is it just doesn't want to listen, but pretending that it doesn't want to have to act. But all their argument is they don't want to have to listen. If I think about the Victorian example through the First People's Assembly of Victoria, uh, and your question around how does it come to a decision on what it's hearing, you'd apply the same principle as you would across any democracy, and that is whatever the voice is, whatever structurally it looks like or composition it is, it must represent the community it serves. How they deliber deliberate, have the conversations, make decisions on what they take to government will be a matter for them, but it will represent the community it serves giving it the ability to reach into every corner of this great country to understand what the issue is, to thread the eye of the needle on what that advice looks like, to actually make government better in its decision-making for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And Marcia, the concern expressed in some quarters has been, oh, well, um, if it's only advisory, what's the point? And we've heard about how many reports are written and get ignored. So how do you get the balance right between, on the one hand, getting heard, and on the other hand, not being, not being ignored, but at the same time not dictating that government mandated must do this, that or the other? It's interesting, isn't it, that uh, both the No case, led by Peter Dutton and Jacinta Price and Warren Mundine, say that the voice will be too powerful and take away the rights of all, you know, 90... 97% of Australians, if 3% of people can have an advisory body, and on the other side, 
the progressive no case are saying that you know what we're proposing is a toothless tiger. So where does the truth lie? Well, the truth is actually very simple. And that is, and of course they're misrepresenting our democratic system to Australians. Both, both of the no cases are misrepresenting our democratic system. Most people don't know how laws are made and they don't know the process. So there are a number of committees in Parliament, various kinds of committees, uh, but there are two committees that see all legislation, the Bill Scrutiny Committee and the Human Rights Committee. So all legislation has to go to those two committees and then they make reports uh, to the Parliament um, on every bill. And uh, what we recommended in our voice co-design process was that a parliamentary committee like the Bill Scrutiny Committee or the Human Rights Committee be set up in Parliament and that that committee would receive the, vo the voice's advice, its formal written advice. Now, when a policy, you know, starts as a, somebody's thought bubble, it goes through a very long process um, and eventually makes it in, you know, if it's successful, if it gets through all the hoops, it makes it into parliament and it, a bill is drafted. Yep. So there's a very long time and a whole lot of steps between the thought bubble and a, a draft bill going to the, the bill scrutiny committee. There might be a white paper, there might be a green paper, there might be an interdepartmental committee, there might be a public inquiry, um, and uh, a royal, or there could be a royal commission, um, and as everybody knows, even royal commissions are ignored. Uh, and so we also advise that therefore the advice should, the voices advice, the national voice should be available at any time to, you know, departments, government departments, to, to seek advice yep. during the formation of policy yep. before it gets to the bill stage. Yep. So that's what we advised. Now, Rachel makes a good point. What we advised may not be the outcome should there be a, a successful referendum. The entire structure of the voice and its purpose and so on would be legislated by the parliament, by the federal parliament. They set the rules they under which it They set all will work. of the rules yep. and they set all of the limitations on the voice. And they can change it from and time they, to time. And it can be changed at any time by the parliament. They can fine tune it, they can expand it, they can contract it depending on what's yep. happening at the time. And so the constitutional question is merely a hook, you know, recognition through a voice for the, to empower then the parliament to legislate for a voice, and it yep. can do that in any way that it likes. There's no guarantee that our advice as, as the voice co-design group or any other group is going to be listened to by the parliament. So none of us know what the voice will look like. And, you know, our prime minister can't answer Peter Dutton's relentless questioning about what will the voice look like because it's up to Parliament. It's not up to the Prime Minister. Peter Dutton has a say in what it looks he, like while well, saying, you know, I demand you tell me what it looks like. Well, his side could write a, a draft bill too. They can. They could write a draft bill and say, we want the voice to look like this. Yep. Right? So you, you started with the question, you know, what if the Tungarong say, we want this, and down at Lake Tyres they say, we want that, and up at Uluru they say, no, we want that. And How is that going to be resolved? That probably will happen, won't it? Well, different let's, ha let's, ha let's have a look different at directions. that sensibly. What do governments do for us? Um, at the local level, you know, they do rubbish removal and, you know, dog licensing and so on. Um, and all important. Mm. All important. Very important. Very important. Not always very um, well either. And the state government has yes. these responsibilities. There are some responsibilities that the states don't have. They have no responsibility for defence, mm -hmm. right? Um, for instance, or 
and, and, and the Commonwealth has other responsibilities, highly defined and limited responsibilities. And that's in the Constitution. And that's in the Constitution, that's, that's set the, out that's, in the Constitution. That's the rule book. It's the big rule book. So therefore, the, what we recommended was a way for a national voice to advise the federal government according to constitutional rules and tradition, the tradition of the parliament with its committees and for the regional bodies to advise their state and territory governments according to the laws of those states and territories and the constitutions of those states, right? And in fact, I wanna say this, every state constitution recognises Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people now. Already. Yeah. Already. And you asked, you asked before, why is Australia so far behind every other jurisdiction in the world that is a settler state and has no accommodation, no settlement with its Indigenous people like Canada or New Zealand or the United States? I've recently been in Taiwan, which was uh, colonised first uh, by Han people from mainland China, and then they were colonised by the Japanese, and then Chiang Kai-shek's people came in the late 40s, and now they, the present day Taiwanese people, have, uh, the, you know, the Chinese people, have recognised the indigenous peoples of Taiwan in their constitution. Even in Taiwan, they have constitutional recognition. Most people don't know that, but there are many constitutions in the world that recognise their indigenous people. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just Australia that doesn't, and Australia doesn't have a treaty either. I think, it, Marcia, just quickly on that comment you made about that recognition is already in our state and territory constitutions. It's important to say that that is just a symbolic form of recognition. Hey? That just is so a symbolic form of yeah. recognition. And what we're all arguing for, a meaningful form of constitutional recognition, and that is what the voice is. Yep. So you also, you know, you want to, everybody's puzzled by, you know, what if he wants that and she wants that and I want something else. We are not a race, I've explained that to you. But we are members of peoples, Aranda Kalkadun, Tangarong, I'm Yaman, Bidjara. And there are commonalities. Now, what are the commonalities? The commonalities are things like decent food, nutritious food, accessible at a reasonable price to avoid diabetes too, which is causing not just a kidney failure epidemic, but all of the problems that go with kidney failure epidemics like mass disability. Um, housing. Everywhere in the Aboriginal world, uh, there is a housing shortage. And everywhere in the Aboriginal world, is a history of injustice and discrimination. And so these are the commonalities. So the national voice will not deal with local issues or regional issues in our, in our report, but only with issues of national priority. And the regional issues would be dealt with by the regional bodies. That's what we recommended. Our report might never see the light of day again you know, people may completely change it and the parliament will come up with something else. But I go to our report because we did consult thousands of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people about it and we believe that we've reflected their views okay. accurately. Right. So we're peoples. There, were, there are now 600 language varieties. We call them language varieties because, say, in the Aranda-speaking world, there are five or six varieties of Aranda, right? Anmajra, Kairich, Kodama, yeah, Western Aranda, Aranda yeah. right? Uh, all of the languages in the Bidjara world, there were lots of smaller language speaking groups. They've all been taken over by Bidjara. And there are many peoples in Australia who are no longer able to speak their language, but we have language revitalisation programs. So we're not a race, we're a 
complexity, a diversity of peoples with our own languages and our own traditions and customs. Now, over where um, uh, the Aranda live, they have very strict men's and women's rituals, right? They have men's rituals and women's rituals, men's songs and women's songs, and Rachel's documented and recorded the women's songs. Um, by sitting with uh, women who remember all of those songs and recording them over weeks and weeks and weeks. In, me in the eastern side of the country, we don't have that men's and women's dichotomy. Um, it, it's, well, there is some of it, but it's not as intense and, and as strict. Uh, there might be women's you know, places for birthing, women's places for healing, but not the really you know, universal men's and women's business. On the east side of the country, that's not the case. Um, and, you know, that's why initiation on the east side of the country is very different from an initiation on the other side of the line that runs from the Gulf down to South Australia. Very different. Um, so we have this huge cultural diversity as well, as well as linguistic diversity. And Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples want to save their languages, their cultures, they are important cultural places and their cultural traditions. They are very, very different. But the overriding principle is the protection of our traditions, languages and cultures. So what is similar? So how do you go about doing that? You have a similar law for the protection uh, of those things. Only one state has an Aboriginal Language Act to preserve languages and that's New South Wales. When Noel Pearson wrote A Rightful Place, he was very mindful of preserving his own language. Everything is driven by his own concerns, right, naturally enough. So he wanted to preserve Googie Yimitir. And he's done a good job of, of that. But he wanted in the constitutional change of the expert panel the recognition of First Peoples languages. That didn't see the light of day. But a lot of what people are concerned about is that sort of thing as well. And while we can't have it in the Constitution, if there was the recognition of the voice, the voice could make a recommendation for a national First Peoples language law to protect languages. Yep, a language And there yep. are 600 language varieties. It doesn't matter that she says, ooh, and we say, ya. Yeah. What matters is that our languages are preserved. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right? Oh, sorry, our. Yeah? Sorry. Our. <laughs> okay. So, Rachel, we've got a number of questions still on our list to get through, and one of them I'm sure you can swipe away fairly quickly. There's an argument raised see. from time to time that this will create an expensive parallel bureaucracy, and therefore we should oppose the voice because it's going to only bog down the work of government. And this is people coming from people who are in the biggest expensive, most large bureaucracy, um, which is ironic. Um, so we feel that it's very... Imp there was an argument that's been had in Parliament about whether the voice should be able to give it, uh, make representation to either the Parliament and, the, and or the executive, right? There's a lot of talk about that in Parliament and people were saying, get rid of the talking to executive. That's the, the public service. Which yeah. means the public service and ministers. But Indigenous people wanted that very clear constitutionally because they want to do exactly the opposite in creating a big bureaucracy. They want to cut through the bureaucracy. You know, they want to cut through that mountains of red tape and layers of decision making and people and discussion and blah, 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 to be able to speak directly from the grassroots straight to the people who designed the programs made about us and for us. And so, yes, of course there will be some administration, you know, there will be a secretariat that organises the travel and books the accommodation of when those people come to Canberra. They might, you know, the National Voice might come to Canberra, say, four times a year. And so they'll need a small bureaucracy to do that. They will probably uh, require some staff to develop policy and research as any uh, advisory group would be uh, required to do. So yes, there will be a small administration to support it, 
Um, but it's, the plan is that it cuts through bureaucracy and that it actually, uh, by designing programs that are more effective, we hope that it actually will reduce waste and spending from bad programs. Could I say of, something about of that? Of which yes. there's no shortage. Please yes, do. Marcia. Please do. Cause I, I don't right. know if you're watching Utopia, um, <laughs> but it's totally right. It's totally correct. It's a documentary. That's how it works. Um, and, you know, what happens in, in government, and it, it happens in every government, is that public servants are beholden to their ministers. Public servants are not beholden to you or me, right? No way in the world. That's not how it works. They are obliged to serve their ministers. And so if a minister says, oh, and you've seen it in Utopia, right? Let's have a policy on X, Y, or Z, you know, the big announce announcement, and tells the public servant, we're going to have X, Y, and Z, this is the new policy, the public servant will do it, it doesn't matter how stupid it is, um, it doesn't matter how unachievable it is. Or and wasteful. It, what? Or wasteful. Or wasteful. And then it's the public servant's job to shape it so that it looks like it's happening, right? Um, and, and very often it doesn't happen at all. Um, and that's what's been happening in Aboriginal affairs for years and years and years, for it's decades, true. right? Mm. The, and, uh, and in fact, it was Rachel's father who was the very first Aboriginal head of a uh, government department, the Department of Aboriginal Affairs. But that department did not come into existence until, I think, 1972 or three. Yeah, that's right. Uh, because... What happened around then? Oh, that's right, that was the Whitlam government. Yes, well, but it followed, it, it followed the 67 mm. referendum, right. mm. which enabled the Commonwealth to make laws for Aborigines. Prior to 67, the Commonwealth could not make any laws for Aborigines because of the racism in Section 51. Once it was able to make laws, and it, it did so, but it couldn't do so without a department giving advice. So first of all, they had a Council of Aboriginal Affairs with, you know, Stanner and those, those fellows on it. All white fellows, right? Very nice white fellows they were too. They Anthropologists. Were uh, well, uh, don't start her on that. Don't go Actually, there, John. No, <laughs> the, 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 the head of it was Nugget Coombs, yeah. who was an economist. And, and he was, you know, wonderful. Terrific uh, man, yeah. Sorry? He was a terrific man. They terrific man, man. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. And... Uh, then they advised on the creation of a department. So the very first Department of Aboriginal Affairs was set up in 72 or 73, and Rachel's dad became the head of it. Now, departments then don't write policy. Minister governments come into power on a platform and say what the policies will be. And, you know, they can make up any shit they like. And that's what they do. And they uh, do. You'll yep. remember that... Uh, Mal Brath uh, was an ex-Vietnam vet and had a very, you know, chain of command, military command kind of approach. It was his idea to put the army into Northern, the Northern Territory to keep the Aborigines in line. They, he sent the army into the Northern Territory under the intervention, right? What was the point of that? Invading your own look space. At, look it up in Utopia. Yep. Um, <laughs> But it also, Marcia, it Big taught announceable. A, but it, the thing it, is, it taught a generation of kids that their parents were rubbish and only people in and, uniform and, that and, had authority. And, and so much child abuse, according to John Howard and Mal Brough. And then what happened? Oh, then it all comes out about, you know, all the churches. And then you have a royal commission and thousands of victims come out of the woodwork. So, you know, the, 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 the handful of cases that the too much... Uh, that the Little Children of Sacred Report looked at were insignificant compared to the findings of the Royal Commission into the institutional yes. abuse of children. Yep. But that came after John, John Howard and Mal Bruff's big thought bubble, right? The intervention. Let's send in back. the army. Set things back um, further than anything and else. So, you know, John Howard saw us as the enemy. Mal Bruff saw us as the enemy. And dare I say it... Constable Rolfe saw us as the enemy. 
Um, and that's the kind of thinking, look. That's the reference to the, the police officer in Alice Springs who was on trial. Ladies and gentlemen, the frontier has ended. We are not the enemy. Okay. But that's Online. something that, you know, the likes of John Howard and Peter Dutton don't get because they, you know, they have the police military model of controlling okay. the natives. That's why we need the voice because people need to be, who, who are living in extreme poverty, and that's about a third of our population, need to be able to have a say to parliament that is not warped and shaped by a bureaucrat reporting to a minister who wants to build, you know, a bridge to New Guinea or build a pipeline across Australia. Mm. Marcus? Um, I guess one real, I, I guess one real example on your question, the size of bureaucracy and the cost. Um, I couldn't imagine it costing as much as the Great Barrier Reef Foundation or as, um, you know, four people, $400 million. We're not talking that type of, of funding. Or Nauru. Or the hundreds of millions of dollars that have been given to the pastoralist associations to fight native title claims. Or the hundreds of millions spent on Nauru where nobody will be in detention Thank anymore. You, anyway, we Rachel. are moving away from the subject Rachel. of the voice. <laughs> Rachel, let me ask you, you're, you're at the very epicentre of some of the toing and froing in the national capital. Um, do you accept the, the sincerity by those who say that at the very core of their objection to the voice is their concern for the well-being and progress of Indigenous Australia? Do you accept that as a sincere expression by them, even though they seem... Is when that on in, the questions there, or is that your question? When they're, when they're <laughs> there in power for nine years, nothing happened, and as soon as they're in opposition, they say, oh, hang on, that's not the way to do it. I think that's a loaded question. And I don't want to get into party politics because I'm, I'm afraid this has been dominated by party politics for far too long. It's got nothing to do with Aboriginal people. This is a question for the Australian people and it's very simple. Do you recognise the deep time connection to country of First Peoples? If the answer is yes to that, then yes. Do you believe that the most impoverished people in this country should have a say when laws and policies are made about them to improve them? And if the answer is yes to both of those, we just forget about the party politics, Labor, Coalition, Green, Independence, whatever you are, this is about the Australian people deciding about their constitution. And the le less we talk about those politicians, the better. That's why I'm here, you know. Can I just say one thing on that? Thank you. <laughs> I mean, Rachel's spot on, and I will indulge in party politics for just one second. Oh, um, my God. There, bar a couple, I don't think any politician in Canberra sits comfortable with the statistics of what's happening to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children across this country. No, it's, it's not possible to. Not anybody can. Well, I'll be political. The best health minister we ever had was Wooldridge, who was in, a, you know, who was a Liberal Party minister. Michael Wooldridge, yes. Michael Wooldridge was the best health minister we ever had. Yes. Um, and he was, you know, that was because he was a doctor, you know, yep. and, and very sensible. John and Heron was had, too before him. We've had but John great, Heron you know, was not a good minister. We've had Fraser, you know, who was a decent man. We've had Fred Cheney, who was a decent man on the right side of politics. We've had good and good people on both sides of politics. And Ken Wyatt, who's resigned and in Ken protest. Wyatt, because but you know, what we're trying to get away from is this political football. Sure. So that's why I don't like being drawn into conversations about but all parties that, use you know, us as they a political do. That's part. right, they mm. all football. do. That's and now right. the Greens use us as a political football. That's right. And Pauline yeah. Hanson uses us as That's a political right. football. And what we want to escape is being the political football That's right. at every election. Yep. And, you know, this idea that, you know, our voice is going to cost too much money is just part of the political okay. football mm. play. We've got to remember it's got one nothing thing. to do with reality because what the voice will do is provide scrutiny on government spending, effective spending on taxpayer mm. money, rather than you know splashing it around. They actually call it the cash splash, you know that? When it comes to the end of the financial year, departments have all this Aboriginal affairs money left over and they, they call that end of financial year period the cash splash 
and they call up their mates, the, the Pastoralists Trust. Association, church trusts, football clubs. Politicians, wives, and, and, pottery, and, and, pottery funding. And, and sh shovel it out the door before the end of the financial year. Sure. So this is what we're trying to avoid, and every government does it. Mm. It doesn't matter what stripe mm. they are. We need to stop playing around with Aboriginal affairs in this way and have Aboriginal voices who want good food in their stores, decent housing, saving their languages. And it doesn't Safer. matter what government's Safer in power, that's why we need the voice, because we need Aboriginal voices to tell parliaments and the executive government the sensible policies that need to be implemented, not the crazy stuff, mm. not the crazy stuff that, you know, is drawn from a 19th century paradigm of us being ungovernable. Okay. This Rachel, is... there's also... I'll, I'll come to you, Marcus. I just want to summarise that. Yes. This is why this was an, the Uluru Statement from the Heart was an invitation to the Australian people. An invitation from Indigenous Australia to the rest. Um, there's much frustration in those circles of, I think, represented by the majority of people in this room, people of goodwill towards the Yes case, that um, support seems to be slipping in the absence of the formal launch of the campaign. Now, the no case have been amplified for the last few months and by and large uncontradicted by the formal yes campaign that hasn't even launched yet. So can you talk us through why that strategy has been adopted and what it means from here? Are these questions from the room, though? No, we've used all the questions Okay, good. I just want to check because, you know, I want to make sure that this is productive for you. The questions from the room have all been dealt with. Okay, good. Thank you. Sorry to be the policeman. I'm... A director by nature, so I'm very bossy. Um, uh, this is a very ambitious thing that we are doing. This is trying to get to 151 electorates all at the same time in the next four months. 18 million people. In a normal political campaign, you look at three seats, you know, that are the marginal seats and you try for those, you know. This is every seat across Australia and not only do we have to get a majority of voters in every state, some of you might not be aware that in a referendum you then have to get a majority of the states, not including the territories. So we have to get four of the six states to win this. That's why people don't want to go to referendums, because they're so hard to win. So it's a very high-risk moment. And the way that these things are achieved is through conversations. And that is why we are all here. That's why we give up our time, like you have today, to come and have meaningful, respectful conversations with each other. Now, it's much easier to win something by striking fear into people's hearts, saying that you will lose something, that race will divide the country. It's much easier to win by sowing doubt and confusion and fear. And the No campaign has done that since January. And they are attacking people in a range of ways. Our challenge with the Yes campaign is to speak respectfully and honestly and talk about the facts. And those, those conversations need to be in-depth conversations, face-to-face -face conversations like this, where information is shared and people can make their own minds up. Now, that is a much more difficult thing to do than what the No campaign is doing. They are throwing mud and they are throwing fear. Now, we believe that this is in a crucial moment in our country where we can step forward and we need to do it together. And so there is, you cannot see it, but there are thousands of conversations happening like this around kitchen tables, in halls like this, around the country. And what I would ask of you is that if you feel you know what you think, and if you feel that you think this can be a positive thing, and if you want to stand with the majority of Indigenous Australians who are asking for quite a modest proposal just to be heard, I ask you to become active. Because the campaign that we talk about is 30 people. How can 30 people change 18 million people's minds? We cannot do it on our own. 
this constitution was not written by Indigenous people, but we are trying to improve it. And we need Australian people to take responsibility for their constitution as well. This is not the campaign's job, it is all of our job. So I'm asking you in this moment, and I know that this is just an information session, but I'm, so I'm going a little bit out of the thing, I'm asking you to help us, to have conversations like this with your communities, with your families, with your groups, and give them the information they need to be better informed, to make a decision that I hope will improve the lives of Indigenous people and reflect the true identity of the nation. So Thank we can't you. do it and on our own. There is... I'll come to you, Marcus. In your show bag, there's a resources list and there's a number of opportunities. In fact, there's countless opportunities for people to translate their passion and their concern into action. And this is a public meeting for information. It's not a meeting to recruit. But if after this meeting, yeah. you feel the need to do more than come to the hall in Wood End on a Saturday afternoon, that sheet of paper is an introduction that you can then take to the next step. And the w Victorian Women's Trust have established the kitchen table conversations, faith groups, sporting groups, uh, state governments, including the Liberal government in Tasmania, local council, major employer groups, big business, trade unions, civic society across the entire spectrum are preparing to be part of that campaign it's all going on behind the scenes, as Rachel said. There's some frustration from people saying, well, what, what are, what's the S case doing? That's what the S case has been doing. It's been doing an enormous amount of work and it's waiting for the button to be pushed for, I think, we think the middle of October, do we not? We think so. We've got just over 100 days to do this. And I think it's important, you know, um, that this won't actually affect most Australians at all. They might feel better about their constitution because it's not turning away from the past and that might make you feel better as an Australian that your constitution has been modernised and is more inclusive. So that will make a difference, like emotionally, I think, to most Australians. It'll certainly make a difference to generations of Australians coming up. Um, but this will make a difference to Aboriginal people yep. and Torres Strait Islanders. It'll make a very significant difference. Yep. So I think, you know, it's important to know that we will all still have one vote. We will all be still equal before the law. Um, but that in this modest way, the invitation that Indigenous people have made to the Australian people, as Mar Marcus said, has been answered. Yep. And that will be a moment of great unity in the country. Okay. The invitation has been offered by Indigenous people, it has been accepted by our fellow Australians and our country has moved on and we can do that in 120 days. It's right. right upon us. Like, the moment is upon us right now. Marcus, it's very exciting. is it a bit like the voluntary national survey that wasn't a referendum on same-sex marriage? There were people, I remind you, running around the country saying that it was going to be the end of civilization as we know it if this was to be in some way approved. And it was then overwhelmingly improved. And I think we can all agree here on this Saturday afternoon in Wood End that the sky has not fallen in and the world hasn't suddenly changed. Is it going to be like that? Are we going to wake up in the middle of October after the referendum, possibly on the 14th, and go, well, OK, what was the fuss about? Well, importantly, if successful, we'll wake up a better country, whether it's the middle of October or when it is. But um, we've also, and Rachel's hit the nail on the head, we've got to remember referendums are hard. They're notoriously difficult to win. I think there's been eight successful referendums out of 44. Um, and why are they hard? Because a no campaign just has to create fear and confusion to win 51% of the vote. Our responsibility on the yes side is to make sure we reach every single Australian to understand so they have the facts and they understand what's being asked of them. So when they stand in the solitude of that box and are asked to write yes or no, they know exactly what they're writing yes or no to. Regardless how they vote, they actually know it. 
because they need to take ownership and be part of the future that we are trying to create because this is a process of nation building and that's what's critical, an opportunity to elevate our most disadvantaged in our country, which is Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Mm. It is, can I just say, I know I've been talking a lot, but I just say that... that that's why you're here. Well, <laughs> that's true, but um, I don't want to dominate. But I think that thing that the no case is saying, like just continuing that point, if you don't know, just vote no, you know, like Norm on the couch. Oh, well, I don't know, so I just go, nah, you know? <laughs> that is really lame. You know, if you're going to vote no, fine, vote no, but know why you're voting no and be clear about the facts, fine. But just dunno, so no, like that's really would be disappointing. And what we're doing is we're having a big national civics lesson yeah. in a way, Marcia, aren't we? A lot of what you know, a lot of what Rachel, what Marcus knows, some people in the hall, but a lot of what a lot of people just don't understand how this stuff works. So we've, we've, along the way, we've got to lift people up a bit in their understanding of how the country operates. Do we not? That's correct. See, even Peter Dutton, to a large extent, thinks that our constitution is like the American constitution. People have been watching too much American TV. And, you know, you, you saw the anti-vaxxers during the pandemic lockdowns talking about their right to such and such an amendment. Which amendment was it? The Fifth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment. They had Fifth Amendment rights. And, you know, the rest sovereign of us Sovereign citizens. Going, yeah, and they, so they're all sovereign citizens, that's right. Uh, and, and, of course, you know, our constitution is a very boring 78-page document. You've all got a and copy in your show. each of you have a copy of it. And basically it's a, you know, trade and tax arrangement. It's a British colonial law imposed on Australia by the Parliament in Westminster. Mm -hmm. It came into effect in 1901. It doesn't guarantee you a right to vote. It does not guarantee you a right to free speech. You, none, nobody has a right to free speech under our constitution. Nobody has a right to vote under our constitution. It doesn't mention the Prime Minister. It doesn't mention local government. Most of our lives, most of what affects us in our lives is not even mentioned in the Constitution. It brought together the colonies to remove the trade restrictions across colonial borders and it put in place a taxation system and a Commonwealth government to allow a national defence force. I mean, they're the three main things, I suppose. There are other bits and pieces. A white Australia policy? Uh, uh, well, actually, the exclusion of all Aboriginal people and non-whites... Asians, Asiatics, through, they were called. ..through their race power, 5126, which still is effectively a race power, and Section 25 is a hangover from the, uh, the white Australia policy. And amongst the first laws passed by our first parliament in 1901 was the White Australia policy. You know, the Australian Immigration Act was the beginning of the White Australia policy and it didn't end until the 1970s and it was actually the Liberal Party Prime Minister who ended it, a series of them did, including Harold Holt and others. But it went for a very, very long, for, for decades and there are still hangovers of it in our constitution and in our laws. So, you know, most Australians don't know what our constitution says and they don't understand this point about constitutional entrenchment of the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples through the establishment of a voice which would have the ability to make representations on matters that affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to the parliament and the executive government. It is the barest of rights for First Peoples to be recognised. We were totally excluded in the 1901 constitution. We could now have, if people voted yes, a constitution that recognises 65,000 years of our history it would still remain essentially a British document. Nobody's taking anything away from the British by recognising Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And one would hope that the people who are the descendants 
of non-British people would feel that the Constitution recognises them too. So a lot of the no case is actually driven by a view that somehow the Britishness of the Constitution is being affected. That's not the case at all. We, by recognising us as the first peoples and 65,000 years of human history here, this will make it an Australian constitution, a modern Australian constitution that fit, would be fit for the 21st century and for all Australians. So, you know, it's... <laughs> and what we're proposing doesn't take away from anybody else in any way at all. Okay. And let's just go through some of the really silly arguments. Will Aborigines have the right uh, to uh, tell government what to do about commissioning submarines under the AUKUS arrangement. And parking and parking fines. And, and parking will fines. Aborigines have the right to take away your land and impose parking fines on you and make you pay the rent? No, no and no. The, the voice would be able to give advice to the parliament and to the executive government on matters that strictly affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And now, affect them differently and to how affect they affect them everybody else. From, from any laws that... Because the argument there is, oh, well, everything affects Aboriginal people, to which the explanation is, no, it's about when they're affected differently and it's... We're all subject to Australian laws. Yes, and no if one's If the Australian law change. says, you know, uh, that... Um, everybody has a right to vote under the Australian Electoral Act. It's not in the Constitution, remember. It's under the Australian Electoral Act. Then everybody has a right to vote according to that Act. What we say is not gonna take that away from you. We can't take that away from you. What we can do is say, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people ought to have access to polling booths, access to interpreters to interpret electoral papers, but we can't affect your, or any, sure. you know, general Australian right. Okay. We can only limit the voice's advice as the question is framed. Look at the way it's framed. Look at the exact wording. It's strictly relating to matters that are specific to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Okay. Not your right to own land, not your ability to drive a car around illegally, not any, you know, the power of the Commonwealth Government to commission submarines, only those matters that specifically affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And those arguments remind me of the claims made after Mabo and the High Court that you were going to lose your backyard and all that sort of nonsense. The scare campaign, it's the same sort of nonsense. Marcia, thank you. It's been absolutely fantastic to have you on the stage. I just want to invite Marcus and Rachel to say, have, in the same way as you just did then, a, a kind of final word for a moment. We are out of time. We have covered all the questions, and I'm getting the nod from Samantha to wind it up. So just a final comment. Marcus? I'll keep mine short. So mine is just... Sorry, I'm screaming at the mic. Mine is pretty simple. Find the facts, understand the information, understand what the referendum's about, Talk to your neighbours, your colleagues, your friends, your families, have the conversation, regardless of where you sit. Make sure that, and make sure everyone in this country has an ability to talk to each other about what this exactly is and what the ask is. Rachel? Um, well, I just wanted to thank you, actually, all for coming out and being part of this conversation. I was very moved to see that this is like a full town hall. Um, I just think that's so impressive. Um, so I just wanted to really give my appreciation to you. Thank you for being interested in this subject. Yes, and I, I personally want to thank everybody on the local organising committee and all the volunteers who made this possible. I know how much work went into it and people stayed up day and night to make certain things happen. Um, and uh, I'm very, very grateful. Oh, it's a wonderful community. Thank you. And, and as well as acknowledging the, the 
greatness of the three people who have spoken to us today and all the other acknowledgements, there is an appetite to modernise our constitution well beyond, for instance, the idea that you can't have people in parliament who are dual citizens. Remember all of that kerfuffle. Someone was a New Zealand citizen and an Australian citizen, therefore they're not eligible. There's a whole lot of nonsense in our constitution and may this exercise develop an appetite for us to have a longer conversation about making it fit for purpose for the days we live in now rather than those days of 120, 130 years ago. I hand you back to Samantha and thank you all very much for your contribution.